Uh, I'm really pleased to be moderating this session. We have two speakers today, Melissa Taylor and John Hallway. Keeping with the, uh, just the practice of keeping introductions to a minimum, uh, John, uh, let me start with Melissa. Uh, Melissa is a senior forensic science research manager with the Special Offices Program in NIST. And John is associate director, uh, I'm sorry, associate dean and executive director of the Quatron Center for the Fair Administration of Justice at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Uh, we're going to try to leave about 10 minutes at the end for questions. And Melissa's well, going first. Yes. Um, so I just want to let you know I'm losing my voice, but uh, <laughs> it's good timing. Uh, it doesn't hurt as bad as it sounds. So if you bear with me, I'm just going to stand as close to the mic as possible so that you guys can hear uh, what I'm trying to say. So the title of my talk is Human Factors at NIST. And um, I want you to know that human factors is not just about bias. So you'll hear the word bias twice in my presentation. And that was once. So the usual disclaimer, the opinions and points of views expressed in this presentation are mine and the people I stole them from. Uh, they do not necessarily reflect the official position of, of Department of Commerce. Uh, any mention of commercial products or services does not imply an endorsement. So I'm going to talk to you about um, what is the definition for human factors, uh, and then some lessons learned from human factors research, uh, both in the forensic discipline and outside of the forensic discipline. And then I'm going to go into uh, more detail about some human factors projects uh, at NIST. So uh, the overarching goal of human factors is to optimize the relationship between people, their activities, and overall system performance, right? Human factors is a term used to describe the interactions between individuals with other individuals in that system, with facilities and equipment, and with management systems. Uh, this interaction is influenced by both uh, working environment and also the culture of people involved in uh, the work as a whole. And human factors is a discipline that leverages scientific knowledge uh, based from engineering and um, psychology, among other fields. And it's resulted in significant reductions in errors and accidents in other high-risk industries such as aviation, healthcare, medicine, mining, and nuclear power. So in simple terms, human factors is just about optimizing human system relationship and um, accomplishing, uh, to accomplish work and minimize error. So there's a, tra a traditional approach to error prevention. Um, you probably know some organization makes some rules. They decide that they're going to enforce them, and they're going to punish any violators, right? Um, and if people, the big assumption is that if people follow the rules, errors won't happen, right? And that when they do happen, it usually happens due to um, stupidity, complacency, incompetence, et cetera, right? Um, and that all of the solutions to fix errors when they do happen really focus on fixing the people. But it ignores other aspects of the system that could also be broken, right? And this old view of error prevention uh, persists very much through today, right? And it persists for a number of reasons, but one of them, uh, in my opinion, is that it's, it's because it's cheap and it's really easy, right? Once you remove that bad apple from the system, the problem's solved, right? It's, this is, makes it deviously uh, simple. Um, it's also cheap, right? You don't have to do anything else. You got rid of that person. Um, and then, you know, it has the idea that failure is this uh, aberration and that um, it's just a temporary hiccup in this otherwise uh, well-working system and that nothing more fundamental has to be done in order to um, uh, fix the problem. It also helps organizations save face, right? In the aftermath of a failure, um, there's a lot of pressure to do something fast. And um, uh, to do something immediately to return that system to its very safe state. And taking out that defective practitioner is very easy and very visible. And uh, it tells people that the mishap isn't uh, systemic, right? That it's, it's localized to this person, and we've solved this problem. 
Um, you know, when I was first introduced to the forensic science uh, community, I was working with NIJ, and someone told me about the one and done principle, right? This idea that if you, and this was more than 15 years ago, but um, I think it still persists today on some level, that if you make one error, that you may lose your job, but you also may lose your certification, you lose your professional association membership, and everyone sort of feels good because now, um, in addition to that organization, solving its problem, the community has solved its problem because it's rid itself of this bad apple. Um, and another big assumption in this uh, sort of old view of error prevention is that um, people can simply make a choice between making an error and not making an error. Right? When, um, you know, sort of independent of the world around them, when in reality, uh, people are not immune to pressures and other factors um, outside of their control. And to err or not to err is not always a choice, right? That um, people's work is subject to and constrained by um, uh, multiple factors. And this old view is very, a very normal reaction uh, to failure. Uh, this is not something that you just see in forensic science, you see it in lots of other industries as well. Um, you know, the, the problem is, is that we can't make lasting systemic changes with this viewpoint. So past human factors uh, research, uh, both in forensic science and in other industries, offers some universal lesson learned, right? So the first one is that errors occur in all human endeavors, right, that a person, um, uh, isn't necessarily broken because they make an error. They make an error because they're human. And you know, understanding that um, you know, really helps you to think about uh, you know, lots of other reasons that errors could happen. Uh, errors can be prevented by designing tasks and processes that minimize dependencies on weak cognitive function, like memory and attention. Right? Attention is sort of this finite resource that is very sensitive to things like overload and distraction and interruptions. So when you're building a system, you have to think about how do you work around these issues that humans have, people have. right? Uh, then there's this idea that drift happens. Drift is, you know, as people become experts over time, uh, in, they become experts because they know what they're doing and they sort of know where to take shortcuts. But after a while, they may start taking more and more shortcuts and more and more re risks, and it might actually lead uh, to error. So it's this idea that um, uh, drift away from the original protocol happens over time. Uh, the next two are related, right? This uh, f that f the idea that fear of punishment uh, for performance errors inhibits error reporting and thereby interrupting this critical feedback loop that's needed to improve processes, right? So while most errors require some intervention, only reckless behavior warrants disciplinary action, like in that one and done scenario, right? Rather than focusing on corrective errors and on uh, punishments or remediation, there's the systems approach that says that you wanna identify the situations and factors um, that likely gave rise to that error. Uh, and change the underlying systems in order to reduce their occurrence or the likelihood uh, or the minimize the impact of, um, of their results. And the last one is about the systems approach holding that efforts to catch human errors before they occur block them um, from causing harm would ultimately be more fruitful than just focusing on flawless practitioners. Simply striving per perfection or punishing individuals who make mistakes will not appreciably improve performance. Um, because expecting flawless performance from humans, particularly in who are working in complex, high stress environments is really unrealistic. So that's my primer on human factors. Again, I said bias once, right? So there's a human factors encompasses a lot of additional issues that don't just center around bias. But before I get into talking about the work that we've done um, at NIST, I wanted to turn it over to John, who's gonna talk about uh, some of the complexities that are involved in errors that were found with root cause analysis.
Okay. So um, thanks for the introduction. And um, yeah, so we've talked about what human factors are and what the risks are. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what we might do about them. And in a sense, um, really what I'm going to talk about is a, a conversation that got started when Peter Neufeld called me and said, hey, we've got this interim solutions committee of the National Commission on Forensic Science, and we want to look at root cause analysis and how it should be applied to forensic labs. And there are a lot of um, familiar faces from that organization, which was trying to do something that was really complex and challenging, and I think really um, did some great work. So John Butler, thanks for your expert leadership there. And, um, uh, you know, it's great to see so many familiar faces out here as we continue to wrestle with these problems. Um, one of the challenges with the criminal justice system, not just the forensic system, but all of criminal justice, is that we don't tend to re-examine our work very much. We finish a case, uh, right or wrong, and we move on to the next one. And if your whole career is built on identifying blame, um, it can be challenging to approach a problem the way that Melissa just described it, where we might want to say, hey, maybe blame isn't the entire thing here, and even if there is somebody that we ought to blame, is there still something we can learn from it? What criminal justice doesn't do is feedback loops very well. So this is a picture from ISO 9000 of what an effective quality management system might look like. You see on the left, you've got customer requirements. On the right, you've got customer satisfaction. And in the middle, you've got this mix of information where we take the satisfaction or lack thereof, and we talk about it, and we try to decide what we can do to create more satisfaction and better adhere to the requirements. Sometimes that means we get new requirements. Sometimes it means we modify something. Um, if you think about a car, right, the first thing was maybe I want something that's a mechanical horse. And then that's great, but, you know, four wheels would be better than three, right? And then you get some other customer feedback, and it's like, well, maybe I'd like to drive it at night. Okay, so we'll put some headlights on it. You know what else would be good? Be good if it could stop, right? So we'll put some brakes on it. Actually, it'd be good if it could stop faster than that. Okay, so we'll improve those brakes. And right, that feedback loop, that's the way any complex system has ever gotten better. Uh, and criminal justice is not going to be any different than that. But we haven't done that very effectively. Now, fortunately, um, we're scientists, right? And by we, I mean all of us, including lawyers. <laughs> Thank you. I was a little worried I wasn't going to get that laugh. Um, so ISO 17025, if you've got an accredited lab, already tells you to do corrective actions. So to some extent, when I talk about root cause analysis, I should be telling you stuff you already know. Because as 17025 says, you shall implement corrective actions for all non-conforming work or departures from policies and procedures. This is not a qualitative or subjective thing. If it's a departure from protocol, and by the way, hats off to the scientific world because mistakes, errors, accidents, misconduct, malfeasance, no. Adverse events, heavens no. Nonconformities, right? Let's keep it nice and clean. <laughs> but any nonconformity is something that we have to have a corrective action. Now, root cause analysis is a subset of that corrective action because the first thing we have to do when we're going to have a corrective action is figure out what is going to be useful to correct. So we conduct a root cause analysis to understand not necessarily the proximate cause or the thing that's the easiest to identify or who we should fire, but what really are the circumstances that combine to cause something to happen that we didn't want to have happen, <clears throat> excuse me, which is a deviation from protocol or policy or work that is, um, what was it, wrong or late? Peter, those were the two options? Yeah. yeah. So root cause analysis done properly is a learning tool, not a tool of punishment. The goal is to reduce the recurrence of error. And in a sense, what we're really trying to do is protect our employees. We're trying to make sure that the environment in which our employees are working is one that helps minimize the likelihood that an error will be created. Um, and in that sense, reduces the burden and the blame and the shame that, that gets brought on people, some of which is brought on by people on themselves, right? Because the people in your labs, they pride themselves on being the people that do it right and on time. That's their job, that's their identity, that's who they wanted to be when they joined your lab. This is about creating environments that foster that, starting from the presumption that our, that our people in our lab are working in good faith. The idea is to identify the core causative factors and then working from those causative factors in the environment in which you're working to identify necessary process and system redesigns and then create an action plan to implement those with a timeline. Okay? This is a chart that comes from the National Commission on Forensic Sciences matrix for crime labs. Um, the question is when to initiate a root cause analysis. We virtually completely plagiarized this from the Veterans Health Administration, uh, but the basic idea is to say, look, there's a probability and severity matrix, okay? When somebody writes the wrong date on a report, we don't need to have a multi-stakeholder review of all of the contributing factors. We can probably handle that administratively. That's a one 
Uh, maybe it's frequent but minor, right? It might happen more often than we want, but we don't need, you know, the level of review and corrective action we need to do is a problem. A wrongful conviction based on DNA mixture interpretations, that's uh, hopefully remote, definitely catastrophic. That's something that we really need to look at. The recommendation we made from the uh, National Commission was that you must do an, R an RCA uh, if it's a three, you should do one if it's a two, and it's at your discretion if it's a one here, uh, to, to give people some guidance on when to do these and, and what resources to throw at them. Um, here's an example of a process. Uh, I'll talk at the end of this about a root cause analysis we are wrapping up. Um, some of you may know the Austin Police Department's DNA lab had to be taken offline in 2016 after an audit from the Texas Forensic Science Commission found a litany of quality concerns and issues uh, of a variety of, uh, uh, in a variety of, of types. This is the process we've gone through with that group. Uh, there's a call for review. Uh, a core team gets created. Uh, that core team involves any stakeholders who had involvement with the cases or case in question. So you want to actually hear from the actual participants of the event. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. But the idea of this is, and something that especially senior managers in forensic science and in, in anywhere in criminal science I think need to hear, we are as prone to bias and prone to pattern recognition as anybody else in our industry or others. And the whole point of a root cause analysis is if we ask questions differently, we might get surprisingly better answers. I can't tell you how many times I sit in stakeholder reviews with chiefs of police or first assistant district attorneys and they say, I know what happened here. And then we go and we actually talk to the participants and we say, why did you do X? What were you thinking at the moment of Y? And we get different answers back and they say, wow, I had no idea what happened here. And it's not, it's just, there's, it's really easy to, to fall into that pattern recognition. So you want to create a core team that represents the organizations that are involved. So for example, if your lab is independent from the police department, but the police department controls crime scene, you want to have somebody there from the police department and somebody there from crime scene. You also might want to have the prosecutor who used that information. You want to have the defense attorney who knew or didn't know about that information or what it meant. You want to have the judge that was involved, the analyst, the analyst supervisors, and you want to hear from all of those people in the team that you have. We typically do these with multiple stakeholders for that very reason, so we're, we're bringing together multiple agencies, but you can do this, depending on the error, simply within your lab. But you gather all those stakeholders together and any documentation that you have about the case. The documentation allows you to prepare a timeline so that you know moment by moment what's going on in the case up until the point that you discovered the error. And with that timeline, you can then identify the actual participants and you can identify them to get their then current awareness. When we're doing this interview, earlier to my earlier point, I'm not a scientist. If I'm going to interview a DNA analyst, I'd like to have somebody else who's a DNA analyst from another lab there with me. That actually is done to support the analyst because I, as an attorney, might have some view of what a DA analyst's job really is or how they ought to do their job that isn't a realistic expectation of their day to day. Having somebody in the room that has walked a mile in their shoes ensures that better questions are asked and we have a more supportive environment so that that analyst really tells us what the things are that were impacting his or her decision making at the time and why decisions that they thought were good decisions end up going not the way they wanted. From those interviews, we prepare a draft of contributing factors, things that, you know, when these things happen, you guys know this, like if it's a wrong side surgery in a hospital, it's never one thing. It's always a series of breakdowns, and if you could have intercepted any one of them, you probably would have avoided the error. So we gather all of those contributing factors, and then we bring them back to the group, and we say, these are the things we see. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Should we rephrase them? Once we've got agreement on those, we draft interventions. This contributing factor, what could we have done to present it or prevent it? And so sometimes those are things, and, and I've heard them talked about in other talks here, it might be that we modify the training that we give an analyst on how to testify, but it's also that we talk to prosecutors about what their expectations should be and what they need to know about testimony. So we're trying to, to deal with both downstream influences of contributing factors and upstream influences that can provide you know, impetus for quality back. So it's multiple stakeholders making modifications uh, to what's going on. Once we agree on those desired inf uh, interventions, we implement them. Uh, we publish de-identified learnings. In other, words, we, in other words, we publish the conclusions without trying to embarrass the participants. Uh, and then we 
go back and look at them six months or 12 months later and try to evaluate their impact because there's always the possibility of unintended consequences with the reforms that we try to implement. And so we're trying to use these as a tool to build that culture of continuous quality improvement. Now, since we're in Washington, I'll use Dwayne Haskins. Uh, but when we're doing these interviews, um, the closest analogy I've been able to come up with, and you'll, if you'll forgive my, my, me for a sports analogy, um, is think of your analyst as an NFL quarterback that's thrown an interception, okay? I guess it's conceivably, it's theoretically possible that your NFL quarterback has not been properly trained, but it's probably more likely that the NFL quarterback is one of the 30 best people in the world at what he does, that he's gone through all sorts of training, that he's practiced this play, tens of thousands of times that he knows everything that's gonna happen, and then the play happens, and 22 dudes are running around, and maybe it's snowing, and the crowd is yelling, and somebody slips and falls, and somebody does something unexpected, and the quarterback has to make a decision, and he throws that ball, and the ball lands in somebody else's hands. And again, maybe one and done is the case, maybe we should just fire the quarterback. <laughs> I've seen it done, <laughs> right? But but maybe you'd get more information out of being the quarterback coach and sitting down and doing a moment-by-moment -moment freeze frame video analysis of that play and understanding what the quarterback saw or thought he saw and why he did what he did on each individual play. And maybe then what you do is you change the play, right? Or you give the quarterback some other information to think about based on what they see. And it's that real time, that kind of then current decision making that we're trying to understand because that's what we need to fix is the next person running the same play in the same situation, how do we help that quarterback make a better decision that time? So asking these why questions, if I, if I was talking to, to the lawyers or the people that we trained to interview, I would say, this is a client and you're getting ready to defend his deposition. You need to know the, the things that were out there that aren't great, but you're doing it to protect him to understand and to help advance preventative uh, safety into the model going forward. There's different ways that we can do these remedies and one of the things that comes out of the criminal justice world is people really just say, well, we'll just train on that. And the fact of the matter is training might be effective, but since the person didn't want to affect, didn't want to commit the error in the first place and they'd already received training, it seems like that's a pretty shallow remedy. In fact, what we'd rather see are what we call forcing functions, okay? So forcing functions is training people to drive cars only with one foot, so you avoid having the wrong foot on a brake when you're using two feet. Another great example of a forcing function is, when's the last time many of you left a, left a card in your ATM? Right? I mean, speaking for me, I've done it four or five times, but it's been a long time, okay? <laughs> you could train me not to leave my card in my ATM, okay? I feel like that was kind of, I didn't know we need a rule for that. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is, I get up to the ATM, I've got six or seven things, I'm late to go pick up my kids, I just wanna get my cash and go and I walk away. And the reason I no longer forget my card in my ATM is that they've changed the way ATMs work. So now I have to take my card out before I get my cash. And there's a lot of things I'm gonna forget when I go to the ATM, but it's not my cash, <laughs> right? So we've created an environment where I'm protected from myself and my own distractions, my own drift, all those things. And so forcing functions are ideal if you can create an environmental change that takes the decision away from the person and makes it hard for them to make the wrong decision. Anything that we do to simplify or standardize our behaviors, that's the next bet best. And uh, training is certainly useful, but generally uh, uh, not sufficient. Um, I, I mentioned Peter earlier. I'm in debt to Peter for this one, too. This is kind of the equivalent of five years ago, my 15-year-old son coming downstairs and telling me that there was this great song that he just discovered that I had to listen to. It was called Stairway to Heaven. <laughs> so I was talking about this just culture concept, and Peter was like, I'm on a board at a hospital that does this. Here's their chart. Go on. <laughs> he was like, yeah, Stairway to Heaven. I've heard it. Um, but this is a great description. So one of the questions that happens is, but what if somebody does do something wrong? What if we do have a dry lab? Or what if we do have somebody that's so inept that they do have to be disciplined for whatever reason? How do we handle that? And so the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and a lot of other systems engineers have come up with this idea of a just culture. And just culture understands that drift happens, that competent professionals can make mistakes, they can develop shortcuts or, or rule violations that, that put them at risk, right? But they also understand that that doesn't mean that you should necessarily just fire a good, 
hardworking, conscientious employee, while at the same time acknowledging that there are professional standards that we have to maintain in this organization and we have to have accountability for that. So what this does, and is this gonna make a laser or is this gonna, yeah, we're, yeah, there we go. So first question is, did we follow best practices? Okay, if so, then the individual is in the clear and we need to look at what the best practices are and maybe modify them. Down here, there's impaired practices, okay? If you're sampling the merchandise, you got a problem, and we're gonna have to take you offline for that, okay? Um, in the middle, there's, okay, there's somebody who didn't follow best practices, but they weren't necessarily impaired, okay? So there, it's a pretty straightforward analysis. Is it a yes-no intentionality test and a yes-no substitution test? The substitution test is, could I see myself, if I were in that role with that experience, given the rules, making a similar decision, okay? And you'll notice that the answers are intentional and reasonable. Okay, we're gonna coach that person. Unintentional and reasonable, we're gonna wrap our arms around that person, right? That's somebody that, that got a bad beat and we gotta help that person. Doesn't mean we don't need to change our policies and practices, but what we do to the individual is we help that person get over it because they're suffering too. Uh, intentional and unreasonable, okay, now we've got a discipline. Unintentional but reasonable, we're gonna coach that person too because it wasn't their intent to do that. And so what we have here is, yes, are there areas where we have to discipline people and keep the standards? Absolutely. Are there areas where maybe we're over-disciplining and either some sort of coaching or consolation in addition to environment change is necessary? Yes, and what that actually does is for you as a manager, it gives you a way to explain and standardize your own reaction to these events so that your employees are more motivated to bring things to you because they know that the default is not fire. The default is think cautiously and carefully about what we do, learn from this, and work with the employee to figure out what the reasonable best next step is. So I'm gonna, I know I'm late, low on time. Um, the, the two root cause analyses that I'm gonna briefly touch on are the FBI's root cause of the uh, microscopic hair comparison where they had the various testimonial errors and then I'll mention briefly uh, the one we're doing in Austin. So this is the summary chart that comes out of that root cause analysis and in full disclosure um, the Quattrone Center asked to do this and we were voted down and they picked somebody else so I've clearly got a bias to start with. Um, but here's what we have and essentially what they have are a highest contributor, they, they have multiple contributors well, highest contributor here, second highest contributor here and a third highest contributor here. The highest contributor to the, uh, to the errors was uh, that the um, management didn't have standardized, exa the examiners did not develop sufficiently specific guidance. So in essence, the, the big problem that we have here uh, and the reason that all these testimonial errors happened is that the analysts were not told specifically enough what to say. Uh, and the uh, analogy that the root cause analysis uh, analyzers gave was, uh, it was as if they were being told in the 80s and 90s to drive carefully, uh, and then later on we looked back at it and said, actually the speed limit should have been 25, and the roads are gonna be wet here, and you need to be more careful about the following uh, road conditions. So this is a management issue uh, and a supervisory issue where we did not provide sufficiently specific guidance on how to do testimony in these. Um, second, we did not sufficiently detect, uh, management did not detect the report and testimony errors. Uh, this was despite the fact that uh, they were getting feedback not just from within but from third parties that the um, reports uh, were not necessarily always accurate. Uh, and the third is that they did not uh, appropriately respond to input from third parties on MHCA testimony errors. Um, my take on this is the basic assessment is um, they didn't set the rules clearly enough and they were pretty arrogant and didn't listen to feedback uh, on all of this. Now, a couple of challenges with this and this is a 300-page uh, report that I'm summarizing in about 90 seconds. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's not really a fair assessment of all the work that, um, that they put in. Um, but what I would say is they were limited to cases prior to 2000 and they were not allowed to talk about whether hair microscopy is a thing, okay? So part of the issue is these people were testifying about things that we no longer would admit into our courtrooms. Uh, and to say that the problem is that we weren't supervising them enough seems a little shallow to me personally. But again, I've got to articulate my bias again. However, this was happening in parallel while the root cause analysis was happening. Uh, the DOJ ultras 
Um, and so people were looking at the testimony, were working on are there ways we can improve testimony. This does not improve the garbage in, garbage out problem, but at least it standardizes and provides some additional clarity on things that make sure that when we are testifying, we are being clear and open and honest about what we know and what we don't know. So hopefully this will lead to a step in the right direction, but it is an example of the sort of thing that you might want to help, you might want to see come out of a root cause analysis in addition to the assessments of the problems, some sort of actionable next step. And now we can evaluate these ultras and see if they actually do what we all hope they will. Um, that's supposed to be transparent so you can read <laughs> what's there. Ta-da! So, We've been asked to come in after the um, Texas Forensic Science Commission issued their audit and look at uh, why the lab was uh, asked to be, why, why the lab was taken offline. Uh, as you can see, there are seven issues that we're looking at. Each one of these could itself be the substance of an individual root cause analysis. And so this is actually a, a, a really, really large project involving tens of thousands of documents and well over 50 interviews. Improper use of a quant-based stochastic threshold and mixture DNA calculations, uh, a corresponding miscalculation of the combined probability of inclusion. Uh, a number of different cases where protocol deviations were identified and either not documented or improperly documented. Number of incidences of contamination. Um, how did this happen while well, they were having 13 different internal and external uh, audits and accreditation reviews uh, that none of this got caught? Uh, and then some minor things like the improper use of an AP reagent in ways that it wasn't um, uh, labeled by the manufacturer uh, and a one-week freezer outage that wasn't detected. Um, from that, we're then coming back to them and having a conversation uh, about how best to reboot the laboratory. Um, question 8 is in red because that's actually not a technical question. Uh, that's actually a political question. And I think when you look at how Virginia and Houston have done things, um, one of the things we've said to Austin is we can talk to you about all the ways to make a high quality lab, um, but we're not going to tell you that it has to be in one governmental structure or another to be effective. The, the, the areas of quality that you have to follow and the governmental structure and budget that you put it in uh, have an overlap, but they're not a one-to-one -one comparison. And so we're going to help moderate that political civic conversation as well. Uh, okay, so that's it for me. Questions? Yeah. We're going to hold questions for now. We're going to, am I calling your deck back up? Yeah. Sorry. You got it? Yeah. Let me get myself out of the way. Yeah. I'll make it work. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk to you uh, quickly five minutes, <clears throat> about some of the work that, uh, at, that NIST has done in the human factors uh, space. Uh, so some of the big questions that I look at in, um, in my work is that I think that is facing the forensic sciences. Do we understand the task and the system um, that forensic scientists are working in? Do we have the right analytical methods and technologies? I'm not going to talk about that. A lot of my colleagues have spoke about the work that we're doing in that area. Um, but another big question is, do we have the right people? Are they in the right roles? Do they have the right information? Do they have the right skills? And also, how best can we communicate the work that's been done? These, all of these questions really sit within the human factor space, and we've done work in all of those areas. So the first one um, uh, that we focus on is uh, creating process maps, right? So process maps help to shed light on what's actually being done uh, in the crime laboratory space. It provides a graphical, graphical representation of the steps involved in the process or a portion of the process. Um, it allows you to document and understand what actually is happening. It shows the relationships between steps. Um, so it really shows how the work is getting done. Um, and most importantly, uh, you know, before you can improve a process, you must understand it. So these process maps have been uh, really helpful to some of the working groups that I've done, but also it's helpful to people outside of uh, the research space. So it's helpful to uh, SDOs. They can use the process map to identify um, areas of the process that actually have documentary standards and the areas that don't and might need um, additional work. Uh, technology developers can look at the process map and think about where technology 
technology um, helps with decision making in different parts of the process. It can also help researchers to look at um, what areas of the map would be prime or prone for additional research. Um, and trainers in the space can uh, review their training to see whether or not it covers all of the de critical decisions that go on in the process. I can't underscore the value of having these process maps uh, before uh, the endeavors, uh, any endeavor starts. And um, I haven't done this alone. I've worked with NIST working group members, OSAC, SWIGDAM, and AFTI in developing these process maps. So more on understanding the task. Um, so I have uh, chaired an expert uh, working group series on human factors in forensic science. We take a very comprehensive uh, look at uh, individual disciplines. We look at the education and training, uh, interpretation issues, technology, work environment, reporting, uh, testing, and um, quality systems, um, as well as management issues uh, in a particular discipline. After about uh, two and a half years of working with um, the working group members who are uh, statisticians, forensic scientists, psychologists, engineers, um, and other people from other professional stakeholder groups. Um, we've uh, uh, put together two quite large reports. The handwriting report should be out soon, as was said earlier. Um, and uh, the next uh, set of uh, topics that are coming up are uh, DNA and um, firearms. Um, Robert uh, Ramachowski spoke about this earlier. We also provide um, uh, lots of different uh, workshop series and uh, informational conferences that just tells you more about the system um, around different forensic disciplines. He had a much more comprehensive list, but these are three that, um, uh, that discussed human factors issues. Then if we move on to some of the people stuff, uh, we've worked with the board on system, human and system integration um, uh, at the National Academy of Sciences, uh, engineering and medicine, uh, division of behavioral and social sciences, to pull together industrial um, uh, psychologists, experts on personal selection and testing, uh, forensic scientists and other researchers, uh, to really try to get a better understanding of what's the best way to improve personnel selection and um, uh, pattern in the pattern evidence domain. This report and um, the uh, a video of the workshop is online if you want to uh, take a look at it. More people stuff. So we've done some work in managing, um, managing shift work. So many forensic laboratories are 24-7 operations. Some people do um, dual duty where they are practitioners, but they also work in a crime scene environment. So I have this scenario. Imagine that a forensic scientist works their eight hours shift. They're on crime scene duty. They're called out to the crime scene. They work the crime scene for five hours. That commute to and from the crime scene uh, is about uh, an hour. And and then they live about an hour and a half away from the uh, crime laboratory, right? So in all in all, their day is about 17 hours long. And when you look at the research on fatigue, 17 hours equals about a 0.05 blood alcohol level. Is that the person that we want doing the work? And maybe, you know, they're really motivated because it was a really uh, heinous crime and they come back in the next day because they really want to begin working on this, right? When maybe they should be resting, right? So we tried to put out some guidance on how to manage uh, fatigue. I see a lot of fatigue here. It's after lunch. We're bumping up against a break, you know. <laughs> but we put out some guidance on how to manage uh, fatigue, both at the practitioner level and at the management level. Uh, some more people stuff. Uh, we've looked into uh, creating tests uh, for personnel um, uh, selection, particularly with, for latent print examiners. Uh, the communication stuff, which is another big issue. Um, the expert working group series that I talked about earlier on human factors, we spend a lot of time talking about uh, reporting and testimony um, and how best to communicate results. We also partnered with Penn State and NIJ uh, to put together a working group on presenting uh, forensic science evidence using quantitative and qualitative terms. And that's it. I make it in there in five minutes. There's lots of other stuff, but we just wanted to highlight those projects. Okay. We have time for one or two questions, unless I get uh, indication otherwise.
Okay. Am I on the right I think we started a few minutes late, so yes. Okay, uh, I have a question uh, about the, um, the hair analysis, root cause analysis. At least stories I've heard about failures in uh, some forensic science failures uh, have another ingredient. They have forensic scientists who see themselves as part of law enforcement teams. They have pressures from prosecutors for testimony in a certain way and they have the furnishing of information that's irrelevant uh, to the particular scientific analysis being done, but strongly suggest that the person who supplied the sample is the guilty party. I was struck that none of this, at least in your top level summary of a study I've not read, emerged. Was this, is this just a wrong view of uh, problems with the hair analysis unit? Or if it's not, why were not these uh, kinds of causes highlighted? Well, I think, um, so I guess the, the, my first reaction is all of those things are potential biases in, in, in the situation, and uh, I think they're all legitimate questions to ask. Um, I'm going to kind of cop out of the other answer because it isn't my report. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, think, I think you would want to have a report that is making sure that it is asking those questions. As I said, it's a 300-page report that I was talking about in 90 seconds and showing one chart. So, I, I, you know, I think that a, a fuller reading of the report would be useful there, but um, each of those is going to be an individual sort of case to ask. And when you're looking, one of the questions is, you know, root cause analysis can often be useful when it's being done in discrete individual cases. It can be harder when you're looking at thousands of cases. Um, I do think that the um, consistency with which the FBI analysts provided their testimony is suggestive that perhaps the guidelines weren't actually not specific enough, but that's an individual view and, and one that you'd have to ask the authors of the report about. Well, I guess it just quickly, in part I ask, because experience with another government agency uh, revealed strong institutional pressures to have research come out in a certain way and people in the make their living from conducting research kind of bend over a little bit to satisfy what the agency wants. There would be institutional issues as well. So part of the reason for involving lots of stakeholders in the conversations is to try and identify those risks for bias because I think it gives the report a lot more credibility when you can acknowledge those biases and have uh, a thoughtful and credible answer. The fact that that bias out that it may exist does not mean it did exist, but I think it is uh, important to bring all the people around the table and identify those when you're looking at contributing factors to make sure that you're digging in the right place. If there's not another question from the audience, I'll, I'll ask one last question, which is um, what you're describing is kind of cutting edge research, so protocol, insights, even, even perhaps a, a change in paradigm. So, so what's happening now to implement this across the country in labs? I mean, are we just beginning? Where are we, I'm trying to just get the big picture of, of what's next to have this ad adopted while it's also still being developed. So if I pick a project that's sort of mature, like the uh, Human Factors Working Group um, on Latent Print Analysis, it's about nine years old. We had 34 recommendations. Out of those recommendations, uh, quite a few of them have been taken on by OSAC. Right, so creating standards to meet those recommendations. Uh, we've seen uh, a, a huge change in the way that the latent print community testifies. We'd like to take credit for some of that. Um, uh, but we have we had specific examples and guidance in the report. Um, so there's lots of change that's, uh, that's happened. And um, we're um, happy that people read the report and found it useful. So for example, the process map um, that, that showed up in that report, it's been translated in four languages. It's in trainings. Um, and people actually use the material. So, um, there's definitely been movement, but I think it takes time. These uh, reports don't just sit on the shelf. You know, people have to pick them up and actually, you know, take action on the recommendations. But. And I guess from, from our end, um, we have received funding from the Bureau of Justice Administration and NIJ to do what they're calling the Sentinel Events Initiative Demonstration Project. So we actually have funding to go to jurisdictions across the United States and work with them to conduct root cause analyses uh, of anything that the jurisdiction decides to, to choose is a, you know, worthy of that. So um, you know, we're from the Quattrone Center and we're here to help. <laughs> Great. With that, let's thank our speakers, please, and back at 3.30. Thank you all.